Hi, I'm Matt Wilson and this is my inaugural lecture for the RSA, first given at Baltic 39 in Newcastle as part of the RSA's Encounter series. And the subject is doing good better. What can happen when economic, environmental and social value intersect? And if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, my Twitter handle is mwilson. FRSA. In July 2009, I got off the tube at Mansion House in the City of London. I was there to meet a very wealthy American banker to try to secure a large donation for the charity that I worked for at the time. And he was a nice guy. A lovely corner office in a shiny glass building overlooking St Paul's Cathedral. Um, I was there with my boss and together we made the pitch the donor wept. Real tears. So we knew it was a really great pitch. We were waiting for a really big donation. And then follow up, the, uh, the donor essentially gave us a tip or what in the business we called a tip, i.e. Uh, when a wealthy donor gives a lot less than they could, just as their way of saying, thanks for turning up and telling me your stories, but I'm not really interested. And then afterwards, uh, I made a terrible mistake. I asked somebody what this guy's company actually did. I discovered that his business model was trading international derivatives, essentially reselling toxic debt. You know, the subprime mortgage bubble, etc. I learned that his business was structured via a holding company in Luxembourg to minimize tax. Now, some fundraisers can do what they do without asking too many questions. But on this occasion, I was really bothered. It got under my skin and I, I spoke to my boss about it. And he quoted back to me a phrase or a, a saying associated with William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. The saying goes like this, give me your dirty money and I'll wash it in the tears of widows and orphans. Wow. Well, that's one way to look at the, uh, the wealth that is generated and then turned into philanthropy. Um, but it bothered me, like I say, and I now hear that that firm in Mansion House is now into algorithmic trading, which as far as I can see is quite literally money for nothing. It's an entirely virtual activity with no other purpose than making the rich more wealthy by using powerful computers to anticipate micro-movements in the financial markets. Anyway, I'm digressing. Just needless to say, I've never been invited back to meet that banker and I'm no longer involved with that charity. Life has moved on and this lecture explains why. Over the next 30 minutes or so, I intend to relay some of the lessons I've learned from my 20 years in the charity sector and this will include a critique of what I call the poverty industry and the problems with some forms of philanthropy such as the example I just gave which essentially exists within a paradigm that it doesn't matter how the money is generated in the first place uh, as long as you know a proportion is diverted towards certain altruistic ends and that sort of means ends logic is something that uh, is problematic to me and we'll see more of that as we go along. So this talk will be a game of two halves really although perhaps not two equal halves. I want to talk about how my approach to tackling social problems has evolved as I've encountered doing good that could be done much better and that will also then lead to an overview of what I consider to be positive new developments happening at the intersection of charitable activity and corporate citizenship. I'm not claiming originality with the title of this talk. You will find a book available by the name Doing Good Better by a very able young Oxford scholar named Will McCaskill came out in 2015. 
I began using that phrase, doing good better, in 2011, but I must confess that even then I did borrow it from a friend of mine in Manchester, and I'm pretty sure that he borrowed it from a, uh, a guy that we both know or are associated with, uh, a, a guy in Atlanta, a legendary urban activist called Dr. Bob Lupton, and uh, he writes extensively on this sort of thing. His most famous book being his 2011 book, Toxic Charity. So, with the disclaimers out of the way, on with the story. Now, even though I quite like to think of myself these days as something of a pragmatist, I think there still must be a bit of that highly idealistic 20-something still alive in me. And just to give you a bit of a window into those lofty, youthful ideals, Here's a picture of my neighbourhood circa 1997. I vividly remember the weekend that I moved into this street. It was the same weekend that Princess Diana died. For the preceding couple of years, together with a bunch of friends and some folks from local churches, I'd been making forays into this estate, a really deprived council estate on the south side of Manchester, and we'd ostensibly been there as volunteers to run kids and youth activities because there wasn't much else going on. We ultimately agreed that the transformation of this community, which we all agreed was a worthwhile project and needed a much necessary project because the community was falling apart at the seams and seemed to require some external help, uh, you know, a lack of capacity within the local neighbourhood, people uh, desperate to escape this place because of its um, highly entrenched problems. We agreed that it would be a long-term job. It wouldn't be achieved through our kind of yo-yo approach of in and out and in and out. We needed to become local. So we did a deal with the council to move into some previously derelict properties. And it was like the Wild West. Because at the time, the ward, the electoral ward we moved into, which we called Bench Hill, was number one on the indices of multiple deprivation. So this is going back to 1997. So that's number one out of 34,753 wards in Britain. And word began to get out. And, you know, well, we got all kinds of visitors, all kinds of people coming to check us out. We were graced uh, with a visit from David Cameron. This was in the run-up to uh, prior to him becoming Prime Minister, but he ascended to the leadership of the Tory party. Uh, this made the front pages because of the... Uh, what these days we'd call the sort of photo bombing that appeared in the background. A local sort of youth that we knew uh, decided he wanted to get a piece of the action. Now, I'd graduated in 1996 and was working in a small ad agency in Manchester, but was essentially moonlighting as a volunteer youth worker. And every day in our neighbourhood involved an incident. Greater Manchester Police described the young people we were working with as feral youth, another phrase that hit the headlines. But bit by bit, we were getting through to these young people. We were making progress. We were classic activists. It was all about the doing, which mostly meant reacting to whatever was kicking off on any given day. The most important lesson, therefore, which we learnt on the job, not from textbooks, was how to think. We needed to pause often to reflect and then to adjust our approach. And a working hypothesis emerged that poverty is as much relational as it is material. What I mean by that is it isn't just what you have or don't have financially that makes you poor. Clearly that is a very very important measure of poverty but it really matters who you know, who you're connected into within the wider world. And we didn't know it at the time, but this working hypothesis was essentially being shared on both sides of the Atlantic. We were on the same wavelength as, uh, as a Harvard professor of the name of Robert Putnam, whose um, seminal book, Bowling Alone, published in 2000, popularized this idea and gave it the label social capital, uh, breaking it down into subcategories as well. What you might call, what they call, what he calls bonding capital, which is uh, 
the kind of relationships people are referring to when they say this is a close-knit neighborhood and then bridging capital which is the uh, the kind of relationship that exists um, across different types of communities um, so uh, for instance you know I may live in a poor neighborhood but may have you know some friends who are in a more wealthy neighborhood or some family members and that gives me access to you know a world of employment that previously wasn't uh, you know, I wasn't privileged to, etc. So bonding and bri bridging capital are part of this wider idea of social capital. And I began to learn how important it was to think critically about the good we were trying to do. Uh, to observe patterns rather than merely incidents. To start to notice themes rather than just unconnected happenings. And we needed to pay attention particularly to any unintended consequences of our do-gooding, which often only became apparent over the longer term. Now, much to our surprise, our little project began to multiply, spinning off what you might call sister projects. We, uh, by this time, had begun to label the work. We'd called them Eden projects, although that uh, did cause a little bit of confusion with the Great Big Garden Centre in Cornwall. Uh, Yes, amazingly, believe it or not, there were other people who looked at what we were doing and rather than condemning us as totally crazy, actually felt inspired and wanted to have a go themselves. They wanted to find uh, a really disadvantaged neighbourhood uh, that they had some proximity to, uh, that they had some relationship with, that they could begin to also adopt and integrate with uh, and become resident within if they weren't already. Uh, there are actually hundreds of these people and uh, this on the screen now this is the location of the first sister project in Salford uh, in a neighborhood called Langworthy we had all sorts of quirky catchphrases to describe what we were up to one of my favorites was to say that we were a movement of people who wanted to be downwardly mobile after a few years I got married and, uh, and we moved to Salford uh, not far away from here and uh, this uniform here this green uniform with the gold badge uh, that you see these uh, boys wearing well one of them uh, that's in the inset there that's my little boy this became my little boy's school and me and this guy who's playing football here I mean this guy Andy we were on the governors of that school and uh, this was a small inner city school facing enormous challenges the majority of kids were on free school meals and the community and the school in particular was trying to keep up with the rapid pace of immigration that was taking place um, over those years uh, almost every week kids with new languages would be arriving at school from Eastern Europe from Africa we even had one kid arrive from Peru I've no idea how his family got to Salford or what on earth they were doing there but uh, this was change that the school and that the community had never experienced before. Previously it had been a kind of a classic white inner city neighbourhood and being a school governor and helping to navigate that change was just one small way of playing a part in helping that community to thrive despite difficult circumstances. But here's the thing. We operated from a really unique vantage point because we were willing to become residents. We went from outsiders to insiders and we worked on a voluntary basis and we would frequently get together and talk gathering from different communities at the time all around Greater Manchester and eventually across the country and wherever we were based we saw the same thing a desperately poor and broken neighborhood and a whole industry of people from more salubrious postcodes whose nine-to-five jobs depended on the millions and millions of pounds that were assigned to our communities under the banner of regeneration it was and it remains an extremely baffling economic arrangement and it really begged the question whose interest is it actually in to see genuine permanent improvement in the lives of the residents of our communities. Wave after wave of funding was announced and released but little seemed to change. David Cameron 
paid us another visit. I took him to meet some teenagers on a bus that we'd converted into a mobile youth centre. I introduced him to a teenage girl that we knew well. She lived next door to my friends and they developed an amazing relationship with her and her mum. At her peak she had 17 different case workers. None of them seemed to think that this situation was in any way peculiar or seemed to appreciate how on earth a 14 year old girl was supposed to navigate that sort of maze. David was a bit taken aback and after having his picture taken he left and we never heard from him again um, shortly after he became Prime Minister. Uh, it's apparent that policy makers don't really know what to do with the most messed up families. Uh, only recently we had Dame Louise Casey uh, bringing out her sort of tax task force on troubled families and uh, the jury is still out on her findings. Um, she was looking at all sorts of things, integration in um, communities that have uh, seen high levels of migration and she's looked at um, the troubled families agenda over many years and uh, yeah so some mixed views about her findings and her work and, uh, and whether the money spent there has been effective. In Scotland they have a different approach. Uh, I've come across it in a previous role I did uh, leading a children's charity. They have something called Gurfek. I hope I did the accent right there. Getting it right for every child and within that there's a, a rather controversial proposal about every child in Scotland having a named person who is responsible for their uh, well-being and their development and interests. And yeah, seeking to address that issue, policymakers taking perhaps, you know, with the best of intentions, a rather clumsy and intrusive approach, um, basically because it's really difficult for a liberal bureaucracy to target groups in a way that might seem prejudicial. And so they, uh, so we create legislation that sweeps across the whole population, regardless of everybody, whether anyone needs this help or not. And so uh, families who have uh, no history of any challenges and are doing quite well, thank you, find themselves uh, intruded upon by the state uh, through things like the Gerfeck name person proposal. Well, more than proposal, I, I believe it is now. Um, enacted in Scotland and we shall see the results of it over time. Um, another example might be the uh, the recent DFE proposals uh, which include beginning to send Ofsted inspectors into Sunday schools to check for extremism and again I think we'd say whoa, whoa, whoa this is overreach and uh, you know just because we've had uh, the Trojan horse uh, scandal in Birmingham and we've had uh, you know, the taking over of boards of governors in schools by uh, rogue elements from, uh, in that example, from the Muslim community. Then we should uh, treat all uh, teaching establishments and all faith groups exactly the same and come up with these broad sweeping proposals, which uh, actually uh, we're, the, uh, the problem we're trying to address is actually uh, very narrow and ought to be targeted more effectively. Now. I guess moving on, what I need to say, and perhaps I should have said at the beginning of this little section, was that many of the public sector partners I've worked with have been extremely dedicated and very sincere about their work. Um, although that needs the caveat as well, that certainly not all of them, uh, because I've also come across um, a lot of complacency and a lot of people just going through the motions. And uh, I certainly can't throw stones, as uh, somewhat ironically there came a point for me where I did give up my day job uh, in that advertising agency to start working full time for the benefit of the communities that our small but fast growing network of projects was serving. And so when you're involved in chaotic communities um, with deeply entrenched problems, it's quite a task to stay motivated and to maintain perspective. One of the ways we did this was by trying to always remain thankful and to remember communities even worse off than our own. We struck up a friendship with a charity that sponsored children in Haiti. 
the poorest place in the Western world. My wife and I went to visit. We visited exactly a year before the devastating earthquake struck. And Haiti was a mess then. I have some friends who've returned since the earthquake. And um, if there was ever a place on the planet that we could have hoped might have been spared a disaster like that, it would have been Haiti because there was just no capacity to cope with it at all. And so the situation is as desperate there as it has ever been. This was a really tough trip for a few reasons. Um, the kids we met on that trip, some of whom we sponsored, um, and had built up a relationship with um, via sort of correspondence and letters. These kids were so full of potential, so eager to learn. Um, so much more so than kids that uh, that you would encounter in classrooms around our nation here back in Britain. And I say that with as someone involved in education, and I see a lot of kids, and uh, I, w I wonder to myself what we can do to generate that kind of enthusiasm in the classroom. Um, but also it was a tough trip because the nation of Haiti was being economically penalised for being politically unwilling to become a puppet of the USA, um, like its neighbour, Dominican Republic, which uh, has a more vibrant economy and yet is certainly um, far more dependent on the USA. And of course, long term, um, you've got a tr tremendously, just an awful story in Haiti of a colonial past and um, they, their, uh, their rebellion against the French a couple of hundred years ago and the price that they paid for that. So. It was so hard to be hopeful for these kids, knowing uh, that a, a nation desperate for dignity had been forced into almost total NGO dependency. And that caused me to reflect a lot about uh, this relationship, this uh, what you might call a provide a client relationship that often exists within charitable work. Let me explain it to you because I began to see this um, in three categories. Just a simple little model um, I've developed to describe the approaches to charity and development that I've encountered and was encountering at home and abroad. Um, to, for and with. These are the three words, three categories. The to approach. This is when we do stuff to you. Um, it's an old school, heavy handed, we know best kind of philanthropy. The sort of tight assault philanthropy of the um, 18th and 19th century. And it's still present today, that we know best kind of approach. I still see it um, evident in the way some people go about doing good in the world. And then there's this four category. We will we'll do stuff for you often describes the category of people who need to be needed, the classic do-gooder approach. And uh, the danger here is that it, uh, it undermines individual dignity and uh, undermines the personal agency of those who need help. I've heard it said that, uh, that the worst thing that you can do in trying to help somebody is do for someone what they can do for themselves uh, to take that agency away from them. And so where we really want to be is in this third box, the with box. Um, more lately I've heard this described as co-production, but essentially it's the two-way street where all who are invested in this relationship, uh, the resource givers, the resource receivers, um, there's a much more mutually beneficial arrangement going on where we all learn, we all grow, there's an opportunity for reciprocity taking place. And I would say actually that um, whilst these three approaches exist in our world today, it is a journey of three stages that we can all track through as well. And certainly I think when I began um, in my sort of early 20s trying to help uh, young people on the street who were really struggling. And I'd been through some of the mess that they were going through. So it kind of almost gave me a bit of a high horse to ride on that. Look, I know what's good for you. Listen to me. Um, and actually, I had to sort of travel through these um, stages of my own learning um, so that I could become more effective in uh, doing good in the communities that um, I was being called into. 
And and so then, I guess uh, a big big shift now. Turn a page, another chapter came for me in 2013. I'd become really interested in early intervention, having been concerned for some time that we were getting to young people, to youth, too late. So building a relationship uh, with uh, a kid at 11, 12 years old and trying to make an impact on their life or even at 13, 14 years old. So much water under the bridge uh, and in many cases so much damage uh, that's been done there and so much hard work needed. And a, a philanthropist I'd come across um, had a really interesting model that he'd picked up from the, uh, the USA, uh, a model seeking to disrupt the foster care system by reviving an altruistic voluntary model of respite care provision. He asked me to become the chief exec of his new charity and so I took the plunge um, into or certainly onto the edge of the care system or as I was to come to understand it the care racket. I knew very little about the care sector but I knew a lot about working with troubled families. I discovered that providing safe accommodation to children who are suffering maltreatment at home is a multi-billion pound industry. 1.5 billion pounds is the annual bill on foster care here in Britain. A billion pounds spent every year on children's homes, looking after about 50,000 kids a year. In 2014, Polly Toynbee wrote an expose in The Guardian, and uh, one of the things she did, I think the article's still out there online, she spoke to a financial broker who sought to persuade her to invest in a company that ran care homes. Here's what he said. This is quoting verbatim. Caring for these children is highly profitable. With each child worth at least two and a half grand and up to five and a half grand a week for the multiply disabled, abused and damaged. Polly Toynbee goes on to comment. The naughtier children pay more, he explained, with a bit of a laugh though naughty may not be the official social care lexicon. There are, he said, long waiting lists of children needing places. He rattled through their figures. A four-bed home will make £214,000 a year profit at 75% occupancy and a whacking great £624,000 profit at full bed occupancy. It's astonishing, isn't it, to think that there are people out there treating the care system, treating young people's lives as lucrative business opportunities. may not be surprising for you to know that G4S and Serco are amongst some of the biggest players in the children's home business. The largest operator, Cambrian, made profits of almost £50 million in 2015. It's a PLC but 43% owned by an American private equity firm. Did you know that a review launched after the Rochdale child grooming scandal discovered that 63 privately owned children's homes did not meet the government's minimum standards? Private companies and public contracts. Minimum standards and maximum profits. Does it have to be this way? Let's focus in now because over 20 years I've seen charitable and commercial interests beginning to collide. Some charities have become very big businesses managing massive multi-million pound contracts and some businesses have begun to move into the territory traditionally the preserve of charities or the public sector like those I've just described, those private sector, commercial sector entities that own children's homes, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. My tenure as chief exec at Safe Families was the first time I'd led a charity that was in direct competition with the private sector. I would go in and see a director of children's services seeking to make arrangements for certain referrals to be made in our direction, and I would make my case on cost and value and outcomes but I also knew in the back of my mind that in the office before me or after me may well be the representative of a commercial fostering agency. 
probably one with a cute name, but owned by a private equity group somewhere offshore. For me, the whole experience raised these troubling ethical questions related to the price that is put on care. Again, I was faced with the issue of whose interests it might be in, or indeed may not be in, to actually see the situation remedied. Clearly, it is in the financial interests of some to see the care system perpetuated. There's no incentive to solve the problem. Now, what I don't want to do here is simply typecast the charitable entities as the good guys and the corporates as the baddies. In my experience, both can play either role. I continue to sit at this intersection now and uh, I'm retained by a couple of different charities at the moment, uh, TLG, an education charity, and the YMCA working in the area particularly of housing homeless uh, young people. I do that under the banner of my consultancy Good Labs. And in TLG, the alternative education sector, there is direct competition with a range of other providers, some of whom are commercial entities. God knows how those commercial entities make a profit from alternative education because the margins are so tiny, but they're managing to do it. And at YMCA, uh, we don't just, well, we operate in housing, uh, the whole hinterland of housing associations and other providers. It's a sector that includes a plentiful supply of slum lords, only too happy to accept the most messed up of tenants, so long as housing benefit picks up the tab. And uh, also operates within the health and well-being sector with a very successful gym competing against commercial gyms for people's local business. And lately in my consulting work with Good Labs, I've begun to stumble across some really unusual and surprising collaborations taking place. So it doesn't need to be you know, a commercial entity competing against a public uh, or a charitable entity. They can actually work together. And this is where I think the value convergence can begin to happen. Let me give you a really uh, unusual example. You may have seen the TV show embarrassing bodies. To be honest, I find it highly cringeworthy. It's late night Channel 4 stuff. On the surface of it, you may think it's just another terrible example of reality TV exploiting the public for entertainment purposes. And perhaps that's where it began, but that's not the end of the story. Far from it. The initial Embarrassing Bodies TV series actually led to a highly innovative partnership between this media company, Maverick TV, and the NHS, which has opened up access to clinical diagnosis and self-treatment in a way that is transforming health outcomes for tens of thousands of people. Maverick launched a suite of health apps. Maybe you've seen them and used them. My health checker, my mole checker, my self checker, my risk checker, my mind checker. Um, you can check it on your iPhone or other devices are available. And the apps allow users to test their health, better positioning them to know whether they need to change their lifestyle, visit a doctor, or just to relax about what they perceive as symptoms. The data is also used to better inform researchers about public health trends. So tens of thousands of unique users saving the NHS millions of pounds. A commercial company concerned about profit, anxious about viewing figures, but also curiously committed to actually improving public health, to actually making an impact. A company that's found a way to combine financial success with social impact. The resulting blend is what some have begun to call social value. You can map this onto a matrix. Here's a summary of how this graphic explains how I in understand the intersection of financial and social value. And in the top center, which is so above the line, is making a positive financial return. Uh, but the center center band is neutral when it comes to social impact so not making a negative or a positive social impact so just neutral on social impact but making a positive financial return that's where classically business sits and down there 
to the right below the line so it's costing money it's not making money um, but it is making a positive uh, social impact that's where charity traditionally operates um, straight down so it's not it's costing money probably uh, but it's not making any social impact you'll just cause that call that a hobby this is where the really interesting stuff happens though making a positive financial return and making a positive social impact this is social value and I would contend this is the future and just to complete the matrix um, making a positive financial return but a negative social impact that's essentially exploitation and negative social impact and not making any money out of it either well that's just basically abuse so more and more organizations regardless of their governance structure they could be a private company they could be a PLC they could be a charity a CIC a fair trade cooperative a B Corp all seeking to push into the top right many large businesses even rewriting their mission statements to explicitly articulate a social as well as a financial purpose and so you know we can look at a couple of them um, Unilever our vision is to grow our business while decoupling our environmental footprint from our growth and increasing our positive social impact but you can't knock that even a big global company like Starbucks gets a lot of flack but our mission to inspire and nurture the human spirit one person one cup and one neighborhood at a time slightly more American that is isn't it you might sort of yawn a little bit you can find loads more examples at unlimited.org.uk which is uh, an online hub for social entrepreneurs um, all these companies however are relatively new kids on the corporate block the real corporate pioneer of a social value approach although that wasn't quite his language at the time was Danon's Antoine Ribou speaking to 2000 executives in Marseille in 1972 he redefined the traditional role of the business leader a proud Frenchman he'd been deeply moved and motivated by the ideals of the May 68 protest movement that had got under his skin and he would allowed those ideals to percolate into his thinking about the role of business within the life of a nation he was the first to set out a vision for what he called a dual project an equal commitment to business success and social progress now it's fair to say that there wasn't an overnight stampede from other companies to follow Danon's example it's often the story of innovation that it takes one to pioneer but another to popularize and so enter a British entrepreneur and academic John Elkington writing in 1994 he coined the phrase triple bottom line and he made an extremely coherent and compelling argument for what can happen when economic environment and social value intersect what he called people profit and planet and following his work we can begin to see the corporate sector starting to take environmental and social concerns seriously not just because of new regulatory regimes but also because they'd begun to switch on to the positive reputational dimension of doing business sustainably Shell were actually one of the first companies from the classically dirty industries to start taking this seriously in 1998 Shell produced the world's first annual sustainability report reporting voluntarily on their environmental performance it's taken 20 years but now this is becoming much more normative I'd be interested to know how many of the companies that you have connections with now produce an annual sustainability or impact report either an integrated report or as an adjunct to the regular annual report it's worth pointing out that there are plenty of companies who seek to appear like they care about sustainability and social value issues but the truth is far from it and so that's where we come across this phrase greenwashing but I'm not going to get into that uh, right now so here we arrive then at the present and social value 
is where I want to just wrap up this talk. Because one of the great challenges for politicians, as I've hinted at earlier, is knowing when to legislate and when to allow industries to self-regulate. We've seen a good example of a law coming onto the statute book quite recently which attempts to walk that line. And so the Public Services Social Value Act came into force on the 31st of January 2013. It requires people who commission public services, such as local authority procurement, to think about how they can also secure wider social, economic and environmental benefits. It's intended to level the playing field, to create a circular economy within the city or the borough, to avoid uh, a leaching of cash out of the region. Uh, the city of Preston is a great example. Twelve of the key public sector organisations in the city of Preston, the you know, city council, the police force, etc., the NHS, said well, they did some research and they realised that 61% of their procurement budget was being spent outside Lancashire. So money was leaching out of their area. And when you're in a, uh, you know, you're in the northwest of England, uh, you know, you're outside of, uh, you know, you're outside of Manchester, you're not your own thriving economic hub, but you're kind of a little bit further down the food chain. They rightly recognised the more we can create circular economy here, in our part of Lancashire, the more our area is going to prosper. And so they use the Social Value Act to really leverage procurement to make sure that uh, as much work as possible, as much contract value as possible, could remain local uh, and therefore continue to stimulate the value chain in the local towns and villages. Fantastic idea and uh, being used more and more across the country now. Uh, there's a report came out from the Centre for Social Justice um, only uh, the back end of 2016, I think, or was it the early 2017, making just this point, you know, government, please you know, give this act more teeth because it's doing a lot of good. And so, come to, the cl come to the climax now, come to the end. We're back where we started. And a, uh, a provocative quote, which I came across first, on Twitter, but I think which brings us full circle, if you remember where I began with the, uh, the wealthy banker's office in Mansion House. Wealthy philanthropists, Barry Lieberman, Danny Algamore, uh, Barry's family, the Lieberman family, one of the most wealthy families in Australia, worth about two and a half billion dollars. In an article they were quoted as saying this, this culture of rape pillage and philanthropy is in the midst of a cultural shift. A newer generation is beginning to question why they can't have their cake and eat it too. Why must they make money destroying the world first and then expunge their guilt through donations afterwards? That's what we're aiming for in the 21st century, to move away from that old school approach to philanthropy where we don't care if it's dirty money we'll essentially launder it through our charity no we can do good better thanks very much and feel free to comment and, uh, and indeed to pose me some of your burning questions thanks very much